mic check, please. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks Limit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brazier. My name is John Gordon. I'll be your host. And I'm your host, Katie Burke. Welcome to the Ducks Unlimited Podcast, the only podcast about all things waterfowl. From hunting insights to science-based discussions about ducks, geese, and issues affecting waterfowl and wetlands conservation in North America, we bring the resource to you, the DU Podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Ducks Unlimited podcast. Today on the podcast, I have a really special guest I'm super excited to have. I have Miss Gigi Hopkins. Gigi is the author of Massachusetts Masterpieces, The Decoy as Art. She's a highly respected decoy restorer, historian, and just connoisseur of decoys. So welcome to the show, Gigi. Oh, hello, hello. I'm really excited about this. So we actually went on a break for the podcast for a little while, and you're my first interview back. Well, this is my first interview, so... Really? We're well-matched. Yeah. Oh, good. So I know you've written we've, you've written about things, but you've never been interviewed. Oh, exciting. And I think you might be my first female. Oh, of course. Yes. There's not many uh, females in the decoy world, so we're probably one of a handful. Well, gunners, too. I yes. Mean, my father was a grouse hunter back back in the day. And he had a friend who was a lady, and she was a very fine shot and very rare. Yeah. Yeah. I tend to find when you do come across women, they are good shots. Yes. Yeah. Well, my mother could outshoot my dad, but was smart enough not to do it. <laughs> she was really good with a with a 410. Oh, yeah. Parker 410, custom made. That's a nice gun. <laughs> oh, it was a very nice gun. <laughs> So let's go back to the very beginning. Let's start there. Sure. So where did you grow up and when did you fall in love with birds? Did that start early? I grew up in Dover, Massachusetts um, in the 40s. My mother had a bird feeder, a window box, which was fairly unusual. Mm -hmm. And I used to gather handfuls of sunflower seeds and go out and sit under the box and hold my hand you know, just at the feeder, hoping that a chickadee would land, and they, of course, didn't. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so she loved birds. Her family was a family of birders. I think her grandfather made skins okay. back in the day. Um, anyway, uh, so, and we were in the country, and there were many birds around. Dad was a gunner. He was a grouse hunter. Um, some some geese, but primarily grouse. Right. So, um, you know, there was a lot of land around. There was a lot of wildlife around. And birds. She had a, a window feeder, and there were a lot of birds around. So, yeah, I was exposed happily to all of that early on as just normalness. Yeah, I understand that. I had a very similar world that I lived in. So when did, you say your dad's a gunner. So when did decoys and that, when did you become aware of decoys and that kind of medium? I walked into Philip de Normandy's house in Lincoln, Mass. In 19, I think it was 70 or 71. And there was a shelf. Above the door, as I walked in, and I glanced up, and there were decoys on the shelf, including shorebird decoys, which I had never seen. Right. Uh, I had seen, you know, duck decoys, mm -hmm. but I had never seen shorebird decoys, and he had some beauties. He had a Walter Poon's bird that was to die for. Oh, yeah. And and we now have a picture of Walter Poon's, which to me was unbelievable. Um. Anyway, so... I saw those and loved them, got to know him, got to restore some of those birds. He was my first client. Okay. And um and it took off from there. He had he knew other people. He was going to decoy auctions, which had just started a bit later on, and mm -hmm. we went down for those and, you know, met other people who collected decoys and were of that world. And I sort of knew the language because what I had grown up around. Right. And uh, so it was all pretty easy. Yeah. So did you, 
prior to that have an art background or how did you get into? Oh, yeah. I, I was an artist and did horse portraits and oh. illustrations. And I was, a, I was a specialist in the horse and never had any, any choice. I grew up drawing horses, you know, before oh, yeah. I could hold a pencil. Yeah, <laughs> that's really funny. No, I, I did horse but... portraits when I was a little girl. <laughs> Uh, Gee, we ought to trade some. Yeah, some I have uh, quite a few. Here. I do. I have quite a few. I uh, did them all the way up through high school, and then yeah. um, my private art teacher, she was a professional um, horse portrait painter, um, and she painted many of the famous uh, quarter horses and things like that. What was her name? Carol um, Rourke. R O A R K, okay. yeah, Rourke. Okay, and she did a lot of the like barrel racers and things like that. Right. Well, it's yeah, it's a very common pattern, and it, it would be very interesting to look at. It would, I think. You know, I yeah. got the other day I was doing something with kids, and this is off topic, but I was doing something with the museum, and one of the little the young girls that works for me came up to me, and she was like, "Did you like horses when you were young?" And I was like, "Yes, but how?" I, that was the weirdest like stereotype I've ever gotten. I was like, "You're correct, but I don't understand why you would guess that." <laughs> <laughs> well, when you look at the Walter Farley books, which I grew up with, there must have been a substantial market, or Scribner's would not have been publishing those, or whoever published them. I don't know who published That's them. That's true, but. They would not have been in the market if there had not been a market. That's true. I read um, the Saddle Club books as a kid. My friends read Babysitter's sure. Club and I read Saddle Club. Yeah. <laughs> so there's definitely a thing there. But yep. And and I, I guess that would put in like, um, you know, I don't know if they all go into art, but I went into art and then I was always very into, much like yourself, like into the natural world. I didn't really have... Much I always wanted to go lean that way. Um, and Me I, too. Yeah, and that's. And I wonder if that hall has like something to do with it. It's very interesting. I'm. I'm sure it is. And when you, when you consider that we're part of Earth, it makes perfect sense that anybody with any sensitivity would be paying attention to what's going on around them. Yes. And especially if you're lucky enough to grow up in the country where things are unfolding as they should. And you're, you're lucky enough to to see that. Yes. Yeah, so I have a question for you. So this might come a little, a different answer from you that I ask, you know, a lot of hunters. And sure. one thing that I have found that is consistent amongst outdoors people is there's a moment in their life that they can remember that like, that awe-inspiring moment where they they can remember being out in the woods or on the marsh that they just kind of felt that they felt that fell in love with it. It was like a connection that they had, even if it's not just one moment or it's like a feeling. And can you remember that, or do you have memories of like having that connection with nature and how that kind of drove you going forward? It was always there. Mm -hmm. And I had a brother, an older brother, who collected snakes, and that meant that we were out. I mean, we, you know, Dover was pure country in those days. Yeah. A lot of, nobody was living there. Uh, so there was a lot of land. There was open pasture land. And um, it was just all around. So when you met, so let's skip back to your the collector you met who introduced sure. you to Lothrop Holmes. So when you met him, how did, so you fall in love with this decoy, which I'm assuming you picked up and handled. And like most people who finally pick up one of these decoys, especially from Massachusetts, they, they realize they're not just a tool. They're, they're beautiful and they have. Oh, there are. Yes. There are. We had many craftsmen who were doing the same target. You know, they were all doing the black duck or whatever. Mm -hmm. And each one of them was a strong artist and did it in that voice and came out with a, you know, a, an effective tool, but right. also a beautiful piece of work. And that was a that was a thing of of, I think, pride for these guys that they, you know, could make something 
beautiful as well as useful. Right. And you see it in their tool making. Mm -hmm. Their their tools work beautifully and are usually beautifully designed. Right. I mean, even to the point that carvers are using some of their tools today. Sure. Okay. I there, I could go a whole direction with that, but I'm gonna keep trying to keep it. In back. <laughs> so, with your relationship with this first collector, when do you? How do you get introduced to the, like the idea of restoring? Like, and what was that process like? Like for the education side of it, um, what did you have to learn to start restoring? Did you learn like what was the process of learning well, what to do there? I was a bird carver from Mass Audubon. That means that okay. I was looking at birds and seeing them mm -hmm. and able to draw them well. And, and, and I'd come out of drawing horses, which is, you know, they're very complicated horses yes. and they do a lot of things and their limbs are very specific. Everything about a horse is very specific. So if you're seeing that and drawing that as a kid, you're, you've got this, this sense of seeing things and grasping them and drawing them right putting them in paper or even in clay or carving soap for that matter yeah so so i had that whole background the bird thing was a real jump because a horse has legs a head ears expression eyes expression mm -hmm. uh the whole body is expressive <laughs> you're right to this pile of fluff where you don't know what's yeah. going on and you can't see the wing, you know, when the sit And then they're so far away. Right. So birds are tough. And you wouldn't think they are, but that's funny to say that because the way you describe it. Because you would think they would be easier and that they're, you know, a, a simpler shape. <laughs> oh, I, no, I, I found them. And, I, you know, at that point, I was, I was spending time at Mass Audubon. Mm -hmm. And so I was around birdie people. Okay. But. No, they're, they're, um, it's a whole different creature. The way that wing folds in mm -hmm. and, and the wrist disappears. Right. You can't, you can't see the wrist. And, um, it's, it's just, it's a whole different thing from a horse where you've got the four legs doing, you know, what four legs do. Right. It's, they're very challenging, I found. Like with horses, the expression is easy. Like you can see the expression, you can see the personality. Whereas I'm assuming giving a bird a personality in that way is you're almost, do you have to take liberties in some respect or are you no, have to stay true no, to that? Because, no, you can't take liberties. You have to be true to the subject. Right. I think. I mean, there are people who, you know, yeah. who who I don't consider very good. <laughs> right. Yeah, I guess it's just more subtle in a way. Like oh, just, very yeah. much. Yeah, very much. Yeah. They're hard. Yeah. So what was the first, do you know who the first carver you restored? Um, it was from Philip to Normandy. And I think it was a Holmes. I'm not sure. This was, you know, it was yeah. 1971 or or about so it was a it was a good while ago i did one piece for him okay oh i know what it was it was a it was a crawl it was a crawl mini brant with a head missing huh. and i said if you can find another one with a head you know i can i can replace the missing head and he did he got a second piece and you know all those crawl minis are pretty similar right he got another one and i copied the head and it went beautifully and he showed it to another guy and the other guy had a huge collection <laughs> and i started working on his collection and that was that was two or three years where i was just you know back to back working on his pieces and he was an absolutely lovely guy with two lovely daughters and and uh you know just they were pure pleasure yeah to be around so that was wonderful fun so when you're work, so let's say this crowd, just when you started, or did this come later? Like, did you start learning about the carver and his technique at when you first started? Or were you kind of picking that up as you got more into restoring? Or how did that? That's something that you look at piece, it's missing a wingtip. You've got the other wingtip. Uh, the whole piece tells you everything that you need to know in order to replace the missing bit. Mm -hmm. You don't really have to know much about the carver. 
You just need to focus on the piece and what's missing and what's around you that educates you as to what the missing part would look like. So it's a very specific kind of focus. Right. And even in, so I'm guessing that gets even more complicated when you start thinking about like with Massachusetts decoys, I think too, with the way they painted them and having to match, especially some of these shorebirds. I mean, they have very comp, I mean, it's simple paint, but it's not at all simple. Yeah. I'm looking at, at a li- I'm looking at a life-size crawl snipe black-bellied plover and woodcock and Kroll did very complicated paint patterns compared to most of the decoy carvers because mm-hmm. he was he was carving for a crowd, you know, mostly Harvard boys at first. And they all had had handled these birds because they shot them. Mm-hmm. So they knew what they looked like. And Kroll was shooting them too. Right. And um so when you look at a, a crawl painted decorative, which is what I'm looking at there. I'm looking at these three birds that are mounted on the typical coral stone. Um, You're getting a very complicated piece of work compared to the standard decoy, which, you know, you jammed a dowel into the dowel hole and stuck it on the beach and shot over it. Right. You didn't need a lot of fussiness for that. But some of these carvers did it anyway, like... Absolutely. They couldn't not. Yeah, yeah, they were artists. Mm-hmm. So that's something I want to talk to you a lot about. Like, why Massachusetts? Like, why in that? I mean, it's, it is a lot on the East Coast, but there's something about Massachusetts where they that they are more artisans than they were a lot of these in some other regions. I mean, I don't want to say just everywhere because that's not true. There, I mean, there's definitely other regions that had um, beautiful decoys, but. Massachusetts in particular. But Massachusetts is, is very strong in having a variety of makers who made their own view of the given subject. And I've always thought it was because Massachusetts goes back to 1620. And who is going to be coming here with what sort of ability in order to start? a colony. You're going to need people who are craftsmen. You need people who can make stuff. And it doesn't matter if it's a shoe or a coat or a wagon wheel or what it is. It's it's got to be something that's useful and that's beautifully enough made that it works. And most, I think, craftsmen who make stuff are already ahead of the game because they're working with materials they enjoy working with and are good at. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do it. So they're already responding to, you know, whatever it is. And I, I, I think most of the people who came to Massachusetts originally were able to make stuff that was useful and therefore, uh, worked well. Yeah. And that that's craftsmanship and design and execution. And I just think it goes with the territory. What good are you in Plymouth? You know, if you can't do stuff that's useful. Right. So I think I think it goes with the territory of of um, you know, the early settlers here. So you, and I think that all of that craftsmanship was valued, duh. And that was passed down. Yeah. Like that ability. Absolutely. Do you think they just had like a mindset of if you're going to do something, you're going to do it well and I think a better word, but you know, because it's just well enough to work. Yeah. And even like they go, I mean, they go beyond like just work. They're not, they kind of go beyond it being a tool. I mean, I know they weren't thinking of it that way, but it is. It's kind of like more so like, you know, I mean, I, think there are value in other decoys, but the more, like, there's lots of decoys, like, let's say, I mean, not all of North Carolina, but, like, the root head decoys, which are really neat decoys, but they, you know, use what the material they had, they made a functional decoy, but it's a blocky, you know, it's a, it's more of a blocky style decoy, whereas the Massachusetts um, 
they're sleek. They are elegant. They have an intelligent design. Um, it's much, it's just a very different. Yeah, they're beautiful. Yes. <laughs> a Lothar Poems is a beautiful piece of work. Yeah, it is. It's very, it's, and it's incredible. Yeah, you want to pick it up and handle it rather than, than use it. Um, and I think, again, I think that's craftsmanship, which if you're making stuff that works, you're a craftsman. Mm -hmm. And if it works well, then you're, you're, you know, you're a designer and you respond to, to beauty, I think. I mean, I just think it's that clean. One thing that I found interesting, because I didn't enter the, and I was a, I grew up duck hunting and I grew up around waterfowlers and all that, but my entrance into decoys and everything kind of really came from my other interest, which I was an art history and then museum master's major. So I came in from the art history and uh, museum world into the decoy side of things. And, but I also knew about hunting and in Mississippi, we don't have wood decoys like that. We just have no history of it. It's kind of, it's odd, but there's just kind of, um, it's bare there. It's no, no history of calls or decoys. So I never knew about it until I started working in this job and like, and got in college a little bit. So I'm assuming that you didn't need them in Mississippi. Yes. That's the kind of the The birds must thought. have been so plentiful to shoot and acquire that you just didn't need that step. Of, yes. So, yeah. And so it's more like the thought of it is, is that particularly in that time period, we were hunting flooded timber Yeah. here in Mississippi. So by the time you would use calls, which we didn't have call makers, but you could acquire calls nearby in Memphis and Arkansas. And um, you would call them in. And once they were close enough in the woods, you didn't, they didn't need decoys. To, they were already in. So we didn't really sure. need decoys to get them that close. So that's kind of the thought. Yeah. Um, huh. Yeah, there's just not a history of it here. It's it's very interesting. And so I was very unfamiliar with historic decoys until I was um, in my early 20s. And But I found really interesting from coming from the art side of things is how collectors... They won't refer to them as artists. They call them their, their like carvers. And with handling decoys, you know, like with collectors too, they handle them so roughly. Like they're not really careful. And you've been in this since the 70s. And I'm guessing they've gotten better. <laughs> <laughs> well, the interesting thing is that the... The decoy world gave birth to the contemporary carving world. And when you've got Larry Barth making, you know, one of his pieces, right? it really snaps your head around if you've been thinking of these things as blocks, <laughs> you know, and right. not as expressions of whatever complexity it is toward the actual duck you know any any decoy maker has got stuff going on in his head that he probably wouldn't want you to know about <laughs> um <laughs> about you know his relationship to what to what he's seeing right. and drawing and carving and painting you've got to be an artist of some sort to pull that off yeah so who's going to be doing it artists are going to be doing it so you're sort of self-defined there yeah I always agree with that I just found it so interesting that they like won't say that and I'm just like I mean how is a carver <laughs> not <warm>. an artist <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness they silly <laughs> they are <laughs> they are so silly well and when you look at when you look at a roast grouse right and pluck it and look at the beauty of that plumage and the bird and when you sit watching a bird i never shot one or wanted to um so i i used to sit and you know watch them mm -hmm. and and see them in the wild and i mean they're just gorgeous oh, and yeah. they're cute <laughs> <laughs> they're just cute yeah don't tell my father i ever said that <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, our other host, Mike Brazier, he's a biologist, and he's got. Uh, I took him turkey hunting for the first time this year, and um, I can't believe he'd never been turkey hunting because of where he's from and being a bio- waterfowl biologist and very into birds. But a turkey is a new thing up here. I know y'all have them like yard chickens up there. They're like all over the place. Oh God, I know. <laughs> <laughs> attacking themselves in your up tap. He's introduced me to, you know, he's a he's a very big birder and it's made me more interested in birds and and like songbirds and things like that. And we went turkey Good hunting. Good for him. Yes. And we went turkey hunting. Bravo. And, and we've been uh while we're turkey hunting, he's got his little app out telling me about all the birds that are coming by. <laughs> it's like Good. how have you, how have you not been turkey hunting just for the birding opportunities is what I told him. <laughs> Exactly. And part of part of the reason that my father loved gunning was because it got him out into land that he loved. Yeah. It, it you know, the weekend was a time to get away from the responsibilities that you have as a husband and father and yeah. and get into land that makes you happy and gets you away. And the birds are kind of an excuse for that, I always thought. Oh, yes. You know, I, I agree with that. My father's similar. You know, I think he's been turkey hunting almost every day this season. The only turkey that I killed a turkey earlier this season, but he hasn't shot. He doesn't care really anymore. He he just likes to go and be out there. Exactly. Exactly. He's, like, he's killed enough turkeys. He said he's like I, and he exactly yeah yeah. My my older brother the same thing. He just he he'd already done that and you know show that he could do it right, which was an important piece of it. <laughs> yes, and uh, <laughs> I agree with that. And and they like being out there. Yeah. Why? Because it's beautiful. It's natural history. It's unfolding all around you. And you're lucky enough to be a piece of it. Yeah, it kind of gives you this perspective on your yes. place. Yes, you're exactly. It yeah, there's so much more. <laughs> yes, there is, boys. <laughs> 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 and, and I love them dearly. You know, don't get me wrong, but um, but you need the broader knowledge of your connection to it all. Right. I agree Once you get separated, you do bad things. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it's interesting to say that like in working for Ducks Limited, and like one of our things is we keep trying to push that, you know, you want to be part of this bigger piece because it takes all these pieces working Habitat. together. Yeah. To make it work. Habitat. Yeah. To make <laughs> it work. I'm gonna, we're going to take a quick break here because I want to talk about sure. Habitat for a little bit too. Um, but let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Habitat, and I just was want to talk about when we met this fall when we went to um, over near you for Mass Audubon, that new property. And I just want to say, talking about Habitat, like I've been around there because my husband's from Westboro and and they live in Yarmouth now. And I don't, I don't think I realized that a property like that existed that close to Boston. <laughs> And it was magical, like to see the like the wet the river there and everything. Oh, it's amazing. You mentioned, you know, there was the when you first started restoring decoys that you started attending auctions. Were you also going to decoy shows? Were they happening at that time as well? Um, I it was interesting because I was a bird carver, mm-hmm. and I went down to Salisbury, Maryland, to the first Wood Foundation. Uh, bird carving show, which yeah. was 19, what, 71? Okay. God, it was a long time ago. And then the Civic Center burned down and they moved to Ocean City. And by that time, I had met Larry Barth and some other wonderful people and was going down um, just for the pleasure of seeing their work. Right. But yes, initially, I I entered shows and I was extremely lucky. So I figured, you know, rather than I thought I won't I won't push this luck. I'll get down as a spectator <laughs> from this point forward. 
and I had a wonderful time. They're wonderful folks, and you know, some of my best friends yeah. have come out of that world of bird carving, which is you know parallels decoy making exactly, and comes out of it. It comes out of it. Mm -hmm. The Ward Foundation, you know, was founded on Lemon Steve Ward fan sakes. Yeah, you know, two of the best decoy makers in this country. One hundred percent. Yeah, they just had the competition. I think it was last weekend yes it, it is that time of year isn't it <laughs> yes yeah, i believe i i was on the phone with um john sullivan and i think yeah he said he was going down he's always been on the board for it um he's from maryland but so how how many years did you attend the award competition i i entered it um i think i think i entered for about two years and i i just was really lucky and i just thought okay let's let's leave you know when it's a good time to leave and get down as a as a spectator and um and i i you know did that for decades and and loved every bit of it and of course when you're going down you're meeting migrants that are coming north which as you get out to you know to have your meal or get your gas, you're hearing migrants in the trees, all the warblers that are heading up to Massachusetts, and you get this preview that I just loved, loved, loved. And then you get down to Ocean City, and my God, the birds are all over the place. Larry and I used to go out birding. Yeah. You know, it was, it was just fabulous. So when you first entered the ward, how many people do you think entered those first few competitions? Like, when did it become what it is now? Like, cause it's huge. Yeah, it is huge. Um, but there were, there. I just happened to remember that on the first year, I entered a piece, and I think it was the first year, and there were 27 professional songbirds on the table at the time so that's not bad for a first year and so I they think. still had the individual categories like waterfowl and songbirds they were still oh, separating absolutely. It. okay absolutely yeah yeah because now there's i can't remember how many categories there are but um, that yeah okay i just didn't know if it was like one just group of carvers comp competing but they were separating them out no, they had they had a songbird division which I entered. They had a shorebird division which I entered, and a game bird. Um, so I had a grouse in one, a yellow legs in another, and a chickadee in another, and did very nicely. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is good. <laughs> so I was hooked, and you know, meeting other carvers. It's such a big deal. And it's something, Larry Barth is the best bird carver in the country and always has been. And he's a beloved friend. He's a beloved friend of Mass Audubon. And, um, and, and he was feeling the same thing. You know, he'd been working in Western Pennsylvania all by himself. He didn't know that other carvers existed. And you got together and discovered not only were there other carvers, but there were people doing wonderful stuff all by themselves. And you got exposed to this huge array of, you know, just breathtaking work and got to know these folks with whom you could totally talk shop. Right. And completely go out and, and bird in the marsh in Salisbury and have an absolute blast. Yeah, I and didn't go out think at about night it. and see birds flying past the moon, you know, when they're way north. I it was just wonderful. Yeah, I never thought. Of, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Like, because at that time, there's no internet. There's nothing to connect you to people. And it, I'm sure, it still was. You know, it's not a popular career. Like, it's not like there's a lot of people <laughs> doing it everywhere. So I'm sure that exposure to like-minded people not only is reassuring, but I'm sure um, inspiring. It was very stimulating. Yeah, I can sure yeah. you want to go home and create after you're with oh, all those you bet. 
oh, and you saw uses of materials that you just, you know, hadn't imagined. Yeah, it was it was fabulous. So what were you working with when you first started? What what like had what wood were you working with and how did that change? I'm just I was, curious. you know, using basswood, which is the sweetest wood in the world if you're a carver. And um I was selling a series of cast pieces at Mass Audubon that I was casting from my own clay models, but I was also carving on the side, you know, for Ocean City or for Salisbury um, as I had time. So I was I was restoring stuff and making birds and you know doing doing the carving on the side really because I was you know making a, a small living <laughs> doing that doing uh you know the restoration work which was that taking up most of your time the restoration it it did it took off um wonderfully you know because Philip had a wonderful collection of birds uh the second client that I worked for had a wonderful collection of birds and I just went through the whole collection piece after piece after piece and you know again word spread so I was never out of work and always kind of behind but having having a wonderful time handling fabulous stuff and getting to play with it yeah so were you kind of left to your like they just entrust you with it, or were they, did some clients have more input? How did that work? Well, I, I, you know, one one client would would hand me a piece, and I'd do it and ship it back, and he would be thrilled to bits, and I would make great care to do, you know, the best I was able to, mm-hmm. and then another piece would come in from the same owner. And I'd go through his whole collection, yeah. basically. Um, so I and I didn't go look for other clients because each client would keep me fully busy, right? Busy, and uh, there was you know no no need to go further afield. Yeah, they would just you finished with one, and someone send, they would send you to another person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it was I, great fun. Yeah, when I talked to Cameron when he was doing that, he said similar. Like you just, there's too many. Like he stopped doing it because he didn't get to carve as much. Yeah, exactly. Well, then I got into carousel horses, and if you can imagine, it, you know, the shipping is a little different. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but if you can imagine a full size carousel horse in your small apartment. That's what I say. Where and, did you put your carousel horse? <laughs> <laughs> oh, in the bedroom, <laughs> along with everything else. <laughs> and you know, the hind leg is missing, and you gotta you gotta carve a hind leg. I mean, that is a ball. And um and yeah, so I I was doing that simultaneously. Well, that's very different uh styles too. Like you're going from a very like earthy, you know, natural tone paint to like a much more, uh, like, a little, like, exaggerated, fun, colorful. Well, the original paint, um, most, m- m- the pieces I, the, the horses that I w- was working They're more on natural, were, yeah. They're, they're original paint. Yeah. And they were all painted in the 20s. And there's a series of colors that were popular in the 20s that are quite beautiful. For, you know, the saddlery. Mm-hmm. And the horses themselves were, in fact, <laughs> one of my silliest moments. I was working on a horse. It was lying on its side in my bedroom. And um, I was removing 51 coats of paint and primer to get to original paint beneath. Oh, my goodness. But I wasn't doing it, you know, level by level. Fortunately, the original paint had a coat of varnish on it. And... I could lift from the varnish up okay. an entire layer of 51 coats of paint and primer, um, which is very slow, yeah. but extremely gratifying. But there came a point when I was working, this was, you know, a bay horse, Brown, 
and I'm I'm working, and all of a sudden I hit white, and I think, oh golly, I've gone down to the primer. So I backed off and went in from another angle. You know, I'm this huge layer of fifty one coats of paint and primer. And I lift again and know there is white paint, not brown paint. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm messing this up because I'm going, I'm somehow getting down to the primer. Mm -hmm. I'm getting below the original paint. Well, no, the horse was a pinto. (laughs) (laughs) It took a day for it to, you know, tilt you into the small brain. (laughs) (laughs) 51 uh, coats of paint that's well you don't have to you don't have to do that hopefully I, don't, I can't imagine any decoys being 51 coats of paint i guess because they're carousel horses and they just get ridden and used they get painted every other year yeah they just keep and painting if the them. thing was set up in 1890 or 1910 you have a lot of paint yeah. and it's and the fabulous thing is that the original paint is in superb condition because it's been covered up. Right. Yeah. You know, since three years in. Right. That, and yeah. so, yeah, that, that, if you love old paint, uh, it's pretty wonderful. Yeah. So, is it, what paint are they? Are they using lead paint like they would for, what do they use for? Oh, yeah. They were using lead paint. Yeah. And I was messing with, you know, I mean, when you're lifting paint off like right, that, yeah, you're getting yeah. a lot of dust and stuff. So we don't like to think about it. No, I just don't think. <laughs> I, I think you're doing okay. You've, you're, you're pretty healthy. You've lived a long life. <laughs> I don't think it's affected you too much. <laughs> well, I used to be brilliant, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm almost, I'm pretty great too. And I'm only 36, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh good. Now where do you live? You're, you're... We're in I'm in Memphis. So headquarters for Ducks Limited wow. is here in Memphis. Yeah. So we're here and we have lots of birds right now. Um they're everywhere. We actually um yeah. we're out at our little uh park next door and we're working with them on some stuff. So we got to see a lot yesterday. But good. Yeah. Great. So and I'm from Mississippi originally, so I'm from okay. like an hour south of here. I grew up in the Mississippi Delta. So in the middle of okay. nowhere. So uh, now I I saw a bird at Pontchartrain. In oh, fact, yeah. that's where I saw my my one painted bunting was the uh, south coast of of Lake Pontchartrain, oh, as wow. instructed by the the uh, local Audubon Society. Yeah. So they um my mom is from South Louisiana. So I grew up going. Um, she's from Manchac, which is between Lake Pontchartrain and Lake Maurepas. It's in the pass. And okay, um, yeah. so I grew up going there like once a month. But when you were there, did you get to meet any carvers while you were there? Because they have a very rich um, carving tradition in South Louisiana. Yeah, they do. Um, but, you know, I was pretty shy at the time. And I actually did meet both of the Ward brothers. Oh, um, really? Yeah. You know, yeah, that that was very exciting. They were very kind, Steve and Les. Was it Les? Lem. Um, Lem. Lem. Lemuel Ward. Yeah. Well, that was a while ago. Uh, <laughs> what were they doing at that point? Were they doing more decorative stuff then? They they were just visiting the the show. Okay. So, um, did you I, know I who they I were at the time? Were you aware uh, of them? Not as much as later, mm-hmm. of course. I mean, that was, you know, that's early 70s. Yeah. Uh, which is at the start of all of this. Usually. Right. I mean, have you even, I'm guessing you've probably restored a Ward Brothers decoy at this point, at some point in your life. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm guessing at that, you yeah. probably hadn't even, uh, have you had interacted with their decoys at all when you met, before you met them or no? Uh, or not that you knew of? <laughs> I don't think so. Well, because you were mostly dealing with mass, uh, you know, New England collectors, I'm guessing. No, probably didn't make no, it. I've, no, I've done all the sorts of stuff from all over the country. Right. Yeah. You know, there's, there are beautiful, beautiful schools of decoy making all over. Oh, yes. 
So what would and, be your uh, favorite that you've worked with? You have oh, a favorite? Geez. That's a toughie. I know. That's trying to like. Yeah. Each each region has its own result yep. in the decoys and their own way of having gotten there. Uh, and, and the men who were fortunate enough to, you know, to lay knife to wood. So do you um, prefer a good, uh, so I guess say that, like, do you prefer nice paint over sculpture or? No, the whole thing has, the whole, to, be has to be the whole thing. Okay. Like a like a Lothar Poems, mm -hmm. Shorebird is, you know, is is a thing complete in itself. Yes. And, and any of the good work. Uh, the design is superb, the carving is superb, the paint is superb, it all goes together. I, I you know, the, the, the whole thing, uh, the design, the carving, the paint, it all has to come together. And I was just saying the Ward brothers, you know, the two Ward brothers, you look at their birds and you've got one carving and one painting. And they're absolutely magnificent. And so much personality. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I, you know. Yeah, you can't pick. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to. <laughs> no, I, I, no I'd, have, I'd have a hard time. Um, I've always had a soft spot for Lothar Palms. I keep mentioning that name because his birds are rare. And I did find a photograph of him, which blew me away that's in the book it's the only known photo of him and he just he he had a sense of design that that i respond to and i think it's as simple as that you know right. there's stuff that you respond to and there are other stuff that you don't and i think you know i think it's as clean as that that um that i i love his work because it just kind of fits yeah and it does what it needs to do and it's a piece of art and you can't keep your hands off it. Yeah. His abstract, like, paint pattern is, I wish I could, I wish this wasn't, you could, I could let the audience see what it looked like. But the way oh, he they're did they're, it's beautiful. And it's not yep. abstract and it's to totally be abstract. And it's totally competent and it's fast and it's loose, you know, bang, 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 and we're done. We're not doing something fussy here. We're making a decoy. We're going to gun over it. No. But everything comes together just beautifully. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, the one in the your book, the ruddy turnstone, that thing. Um, <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> wouldn't mind owning that. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad yeah, Paul so. Tudor Jones still has it. <laughs> oh. And he, he doesn't appreciate it. You know, we've been to his ginormous place. Cambridge, wherever the hell it is in <laughs> London, he doesn't care. You know, it's just more stuff, and it's down in the TV room. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> we had his and, uh, we had his uh, his ducks for a while. Um, like when we first opened the museum, and we had um, his Lincoln, but they're all now in his new camp in Georgia. So um, <laughs> he had to build, he built a house for his, his ducks. So I guess all the, the shorebirds are in Massachusetts and all the ducks are in Georgia. Well, that's sort of silly. <laughs> yep. I got to keep the Lincoln though for a full year. It was great. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Cause that, Lincoln birds. That Lincoln would. Clean. Oh, he had oh, the wood duck, uh, the Lincoln wood duck. Oh God. That's a, that's a bird and a half. Oh, it's that's beautiful. A, she he was so good, so the it, the elegance of that thing, and the quietness of it, you know, it's not showing off. Yeah, you you I, I read and I read your book and I love that you use the word the quiet. You use quietness to describe some of these birds, and it's true. It's just like this understated beauty beauty that comes out of them that you really. We say this to new collectors and people who want to get into them, like you have to go to a show or an auction and handle them because there's just something you're never going to get from a picture. You just have to go see them. Exactly. And the sense of age is as important as the piece, you know, the fact that this was done 50 years ago. 
yeah. as a working, it's a working tool. And I'm not talking about decorative stuff. I mean, you know, the working birds, the Lincolns are all working birds. And uh, God, there are pictures of him with yards just full of decoys. That <laughs> just kill you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I know. I know. I was going through your book again, and I was going through the Carvers. <laughs> and it's so hard to read some of the stories because I feel like every story ends with, and a sack of decoys was taken somewhere and burned. <laughs> so, uh, and it's just like, how many oh, decoys a did they of just decoys burn? Taken and burned. Yes. Oh, uh, it's like, it's yeah, heartbreaking. That, uh, but they never thought of them that way. So they just didn't, they didn't, yeah, especially the people, you know, because I'm guessing they gave them a lot of, you know, car for camps and you know clubs and things like that and the people who were you know they the people who were working with the decoys that weren't related to the carver in any way um they just thought of them as these things we shoot over and like yeah oh. yeah they threw them under the camp <laughs> actually we're, we're we're happy if they did throw them under the camp because maybe someone later picked that back up <laughs> and they made them back out but the burning i was oh. just like oh my gosh Okay, I have one selfish question before we go. Sure. Because <laughs> um, so being a woman and being in this field and being around all these collectors and carvers, you've been doing this a lot longer than me. And, and I, I, you know, I find myself like it's still, I mean, there are more women and it's great. I'm, there, are more, there are starting to be more women there. I mean, though it's rare that you're not there with your spouse. Like it tends to be like, I'm very usually like by my being a woman without like my husband doesn't come with me things. He doesn't he couldn't care less about wooden decoys. <laughs> but <laughs> so sure. he, yeah, so he's not usually with me and I'm here for work. How don't bother me. I'm I'm playing with my carburetor. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> well, no, he's not that either. He's more into <laughs> video games. But um, <laughs> Oh, that's worse. <laughs> yes. So he um so like what was that like for you like going through that and I mean I've been very welcomed like I've never really had a lot of an issue but was that difficult do you have any advice um it was not the slightest bit difficult because people were looking at the work and and you know all of the guys that were my collectors were pretty neat people and I enjoyed that. And having grown up with my dad in a gunning tradition, I knew the language. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've plucked ducks and grouse, and so I've had hands on in that. And a lot of these collectors aren't gunners, too. Right. Yeah. Yes. They're collecting yes. art, although they wouldn't call it that. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I grew up with two older brothers and a father, and my mother was out of the seen early on so i i just never had any problem with the fact that i was around guys they you know they were who i hung out with right and they had this material and appreciated it and it was great and i had a lovely time and they always treated me to dinner which was sweet <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there were advantages which I was not beyond taking advantage of. I don't blame you. <laughs> so, and and their wives were pretty neat. Yeah, most of the yeah most of the wives that I met were really nice ladies, interested in stuff, not necessarily the same stuff. But I I just I was very lucky, and my clients were a great group of people, and I had a ball. And I was handling stuff that just took your breath away. No, I I agree. I haven't had any issues. I've been welcomed and people have, you know, and I grew up with a dad, hunting with a dad and a brother. And, you know, I'm comfortable in these situations. But yeah, and I will say I have to agree. The people I have met, I mean, you included and Amy um, with Mass Audubon, I've just, it's made my life better. And I'm so thankful that I fell into it. <laughs> so. And uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's what it's been. It's been falling into it. Mm -hmm. But they are. They're neat people. They love to be outdoors. Amy's absolutely wonderful. She's brilliant, and you wouldn't necessarily guess that. And she's completely warm and 
I mean, she she's an unusual group of attributes. And, you know, being brilliant is there, but it's very quiet. It's very, you know, it's very low-key. You would not guess that you're talking with a dazzlingly bright person who sees things, which is not that common. One of the things that a carver needs to do is see stuff. You need to see the bird. You need to understand it. You need to make a pattern, see the pattern. Going out on a walk with Larry Barth when you're pointing at little things you know, that are visually pleasing that nobody else would even see. And you're finally with someone who's seeing the same stuff and pointing to it and saying, oh, look. And Amy's the same way. She's got really good eyesight. And, you know, she can look at art and get it immediately. And you can talk about any aspect Mm -hmm. of that painting or sculpture with her and she's right there yeah. and that's a ball yeah. that is just such a pleasure yeah especially with you spending your whole life doing it it's nice to find a friend that you can oh do that with. yeah yeah and yeah. i'm sure working on the book was just a joy <laughs> oh it was a blast yes absolutely well yeah. um i've taken up a lot of your time so um yeah. which i have really enjoyed <laughs> so that before we go we end this can you do you have anything you'd like to leave say or leave with our audience uh not really appreciate the natural world of whatever you've got of it left around you get out into it because it's pretty wonderful that it is and yeah i mean butterflies migrating are you kidding me (laughs) (laughs) i mean come on (laughs) um you know and you see see a monarch a couple of years ago i was in the in the community garden and there's a big horse barn and i saw this this single you know monarch flying ground level the way they do and it went up and over the barn and continued south. And I thought, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's just amazing. <laughs> and I've seen them flying down. You know, you're walking along the shore of the Cape, and they're, they're two feet over the water, huh. you know, and they could be over the shore where you're walking. But right. no, they're over the bloody water, <laughs> and they're flying south along the water line. And you're thinking, holy moly, do that butterfly's going. Yeah, I know. It's and crazy. And it's got scales on the wing that if you touch the wing, you knock the scales off. Oh my God. You know, that's um, that sort of stuff is, is enough to keep you engaged and in love with everything out there and appreciating it, even though we know nothing, you know, yeah. really, uh, relatively speaking. And, um, uh, I just think, you know, if you got it around, get out there and look, yeah. you know, see it, hear it, appreciate it, because it's amazing. It's yeah, neat. It is. And we're small yeah. in comparison. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's, but we're, but we're a part of it, yes. which is most peculiar considering our impact on the planet at this point. I mean, the whole thing is very mysterious, I mean, you know. Don't pretend to understand it, but <laughs> hey. <laughs> we try and fail yeah. over and over again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> and the trying is the important That's stuff. That's the important part. Well, Gigi, thank you so much. This has been great. You're very welcome. <laughs> Anytime. Well, thank you, Gigi, for coming on the show. Thank you to Chris, Isaac, our producer, and thank you to our listeners for supporting wetlands and waterfowl conservation. Thank you for listening to this episode of the DU Podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And visit www.ducks.org slash DU Podcast for resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes. Opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ducks Unlimited. Until next time, stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned to the Ducks.